All right, Vine Church LV, welcome the national and the international audience to the church today. Hallelujah. India, Africa, Europe, Israel, South America. You're all welcome here. And I had a brother from Asia as well contact me. We love you. We love you and we're glad you're here in Jesus' name. We pray today you're going to be blessed. I'm Apostle Sean Mark. I'm the senior pastor of the Vine Church LV. Very excited about today because I get to sit and get a word. Someone say get a word. Get a word. Prophet has started talking about this, this powerful thing about glory that God was speaking to her this week. And I've been like patiently, not really, you guys know me, but patiently trying to wait to get this word. So without further ado, let's welcome the lady of the house. First lady of the house, Prophetess Jen. Come on, girl. Yeah. For this day that you would be glorified in this word in this time in Jesus name so my message today is called reflect his glory and this was birthed really just out of my heart and kind of my personal um, place where I'm at with the Lord you know um, my husband and I we were on a prayer walk and he says you know what's the matter with you and I said you know <laughs> I just can't pinpoint it but I'm just not satisfied I know there's more. Amen. I know there's greater. But I'm not seeing that. And that bothers me. Anybody else join me in that? Yes. God, I know there's more. I know there's greater, but but I'm not seeing that. And that kind of upsets me. And so I asked God questions. I said, God, why are we not? And I'm not saying in nowhere, but why are we, especially churches in America, not seeing the glory of God every service, every day, continuously. And God is uh, so faithful because he always gives me an answer. And he said, because my people are not reflecting my glory. Well, come on now. Come on. See, I'm thinking it's like, God, you're not showing up. And he said, no, I'm already there, but you have to reflect it. See, we are supposed to reflect his glory. And, and, and the Lord took me to Moses. And sometimes I have to admit, I feel like Moses. Because the Lord's given me a responsibility. And I'm like, but God, how? Like, you have to show up. So we're going to read in Exodus a little bit about Moses. How many think Moses had an awesome responsibility? Come on, he had a big call from God, right? God had big things for him to do. Wow. And, you know, some of us are that same way. We have an awesome responsibility, a call, something that God has called us to do. And it's like, well, how am I going to do this, God? So let's look at an Exodus 33, starting in verse 12. And we'll go through 18. And it says, one day Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. See, Moses is like me. I'm asking God, why am I not seeing your glory? And I'm, I'm waiting for him to answer. And Moses is kind of doing the same thing, right? Okay, God, you're telling me I'm going to take all these people to the promised land. That's awesome. But who are you sending with me? Right? I need to know. And he says, you have told me I know you by name. And I look favorably upon you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. See, something that Moses said right is, God, I need to know you more. Come on. I need to know your ways. I need to know your favor. And that was the first thing that he had right. And then he reminded God, and he said, remember that this nation is your very own people. Right? <laughs> These are your people. This is the job that you've given me to do. And this is what the Lord tells Moses. He said, I will personally go with you. And I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. So what is he telling Moses? You want an answer, but just trust me. <laughs> I'll go with you. And I think God would say that to some of you. First of all, I know your name. Just like he knew Moses' name. He knows your name. He looks favorably upon you. And he's going to go with you. Come on, Lord. 
Amen. That's, that's what he told them. And he said, then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. And you know, this is the, my cry to the Lord. Lord, if you don't show up, I don't want to go. There's no place I want to minister if you don't go with me. There's no prayer meeting I want to have if you don't go with me. There's no place I want to go if you don't go with me. I need you to go with me, God. I don't want to go by myself. I don't want to try and do it in my strength and my glory. I need you and your glory. I need you to go with me, right? And then he says, how will anyone know if you look favorably on me? On me and my people if you don't go with us. Right? Because when you have favor, God is with you. That's right. That's good. When the favor of God is on you, his presence and glory oh, is yeah. on you. It's with you. And he's saying, look, if I have your favor, then you better go with me. Right? How will the people know I have your favor if you don't go with me? He says, for your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. Come on now, say that. Are you set apart? What sets you apart from the world? His presence in you. Come on now. That's what makes this difference. So if I don't have his presence, I'm just like everybody else, right? right? And he's saying, God, I need the people to see that we're of you, that we're set apart. And the only way they're going to know that is because your presence is with us. Yeah, that's right. Come on. And the Lord replied to Moses. I do this with God sometimes. We have our bathroom force. Like, he talks, and then I, I remind him of things, and then he tells me things, and I ask him questions, and it's okay to talk to God. Come on, say that. Yeah. And then the Lord uh, replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. And Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. If you know my name, and I have your favor, then show me your glory. Come on. Show me your presence. Well, come on, man. And so my concern is in churches in America, where is his presence? Come on. Why are we going through the motions, but there's no presence? On, there's man. no glory. It looks just like everything else. And I've told God that. If you know me by name, and I've gotten prophetic words that the favor of the Lord is on you. Then show me your glory. But first, let me know your ways. God says, seek me and you shall find me. Part of this journey is knowing him and his ways. And then I tell the Lord this. I told the Lord before I came up here this morning, if you don't go with me, I don't want to go. Come on, we got to get to the place where we say, God, you have to go with me. I need your presence. I need the people to see that I have the favor and that I'm set apart from them. You set me apart by your presence. Moses understood this, that the reason that he was set apart and different is because the presence of God was with him and on him. And I like Moses. He was bold. Okay, you know my name? You say I have favor? Show me your glory. Right? And what did God do? He showed up. And he showed off. Didn't he? And the people knew that Moses belonged to God. Didn't they? So let's go to Exodus 34.10. The Lord replied, listen, I'm making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people. This is God talking to who? Moses. And he says, I will perform miracles that have never been perform, performed anywhere in all the earth or in any nation. How many people think that's pretty amazing? And all the people around you will see the power of the Lord, the awesome power I will display for you. And I begin to ask that, God, why are we not seeing miracles? We see them, but come on, there's a greater level. The, the church should be a place when I'm sick, I run to because a miracle's going to happen. That's good. Come on. When I'm demon oppressed, I run because the presence of God is there and I'm going to be delivered and set free. When I have addictions, I run to the house of God because the presence is so that I just have to 
to be changed because a miracle is going to happen. But I don't see people running to churches and flocks. Why? They're like, oh, that's just like any other place. They're not seeing the manifest presence and the miracles of God. Come on. And the Lord told him, I'll do it. But who did he use to do it? Moses. Didn't he do it through Moses? He would instruct Moses, go do this. The sea would split, right? Go do this. And it would just happen, right? Because his presence, his manifest presence was with him. Miracles happen in his presence. And so we need that glory. We need the presence of God. But here's the thing is, see, in Moses' time, he wasn't indwelt. We are. So guess what? You carry the presence in with you. So you should be reflecting his glory. You should be performing miracles. You should be laying hands on the sick and they recover. You should be doing that. But we're always sitting back waiting for the pastor to do it. Or the evangelist to do it. Why? The same power, the same spirit that's in us is the same spirit that's in you, right? So you should be performing miracles. You should be laying hands, right? What if everybody in here started moving in miraculous power? Because they came and reflected the glory of the Lord. What kind of church services might we have? This is the things that I long to see. My heart. And I will never be satisfied until I see it. And I'm going to declare it right now. I will see the glory of the Lord. And I will reflect the glory of the Lord. And I will see his miracles. Amen? Come on, we're going to see it. We're going to do big things here in Vegas. People are going to run to the Vine Church LB because they need to be in the presence of God. Amen? Let's look at Exodus 34, 29. It says, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. So when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance as Moses' face, they were afraid to come near him. Do you know when you reflect the glory, it's going to scare some people? The reason some churches have quit operating in miracles and the glory of God because people get scared. Ooh, I don't want to go to that church. They do speak in tongues and weird things happen. And ooh, it scares me, right? But see... When Moses was in the presence of God, he couldn't help but reflect and radiate his glory. Right? right? Are we any different? We're indwelled. When we, we're in his presence, we should come out and radiate. People should be able to look at us and say, wow, you're radiating. Wow, I see the glory of God on you. Wow, his presence is on you. That's where we should be. Moses reflected God's glory. And when you spend time in his presence, you should reflect his glory too. But the glory does scare people. It does. But let me tell you, they can be scared until they have a diagnosis. Then they ain't scared anymore. Then it's like, I don't care how scared I am, I need to go to that place because I need my healing. I need my miracle, right? So, Let's scare the hell out of them, right? Come on! Let's scare, let's scare them good, right? With the Holy Spirit, with miracles, where they can't deny the power of God. Come on! I dream of the day. Let that be us, Lord. Let that be the Vine Church LV, a house of miracles, a house of the presence of God. Father, where you're manifested, presence is among us. Reflect your glory. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I pray your people would reflect your glory. Come on. Stephen was a man that reflected God's glory. The Bible says he was a man full of God's grace and power, and he performed amazing miracles. Amazing miracles. But guess what? The naysayers came out. Yep. What they do? They started arguing with them. They started lying on him, right? Saying he was speaking against Moses and he was doing all these things, right? 
See, when you carry the glory, you're going to have haters. You're always going to have haters. And some people have quit walking in the glory because they have too many haters. And they start listening to haters rather than following Christ. Who cares what the people say? They're going to come against you. Oh, that ain't real. They're going to do it. But do you care? Come on. Tell the truth. The men lied on him, and he was arrested. But I like if we fast forward. This is in Acts 6, verse 15. It says, at this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen. Because his face became as bright as an angel, Stephen reflected the glory of the Lord. See, you can mess with God's anointed, but God will reflect his glory. They're going to be like, uh-oh, his face is shining. It looks like an angel. Whoa. They know they've just messed with God's child. Right? But you will be persecuted. The people will not like you. But who cares? So this is the old covenant and the miracles that we saw. But we're not even under the old covenant. Now we're under the new covenant. So now if we're under the new covenant, how much greater should it be than the old covenant? And this is where I become frustrated. God said we would do greater things. Where is the greater? I want to see the greater. I read about the greatness and the miracles. I want to see the greater. And I won't be satisfied until I see it. Let's read about the glory of the new covenant in 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 7. It says, The old way with laws etched in stone led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people could not bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God, even, through the, even though the brightness was already fading. Why do you think the brightness began to fade? Could it be all the naysayers? All the unbelievers? Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way? Now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared to the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way? Come on. Do you get the theme? What are we repeating? How much more glorious, right? Yeah, yeah. Is the new way. So, um, so glorious. How much more glorious is the new way which remains forever? Since the new way gives us confidence, we can be very bold. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see people in church being bold. We need to be bold. We have a confidence. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened. Why did the glory go away? Their minds were hardened. I believe the reason we're not seeing the glory in church because people's minds are hardened. And to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. So the minute you start talking about the power and the glory and the miracles, it doesn't make sense. They can't understand it. They can't fathom it. And this veil can be removed by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writing, their hearts are covered with a veil, and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom to be in his glory. Freedom to be in his presence. Freedom to walk in the miracles and the giftings of God that he's placed on your life. So all of us, everybody say, all of us, all of us, who have had the veil removed, how many people have had the veil removed in here, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. 
You can see it and you can reflect it because you're in Christ and the veil has been removed. And the Lord who is spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. When we see and reflect his glory, we're being made more and more into his image. Right? Because we're reflecting Christ. We're walking as Christ walked. We're performing miracles as Christ performed miracles, right? We're becoming more and more like him. Amen. That veil was torn. The veil has been torn. It's been Come removed. On. Come on. Glory. You should rejoice. The veil has been torn. The veil has been torn. Come on. The veil has been removed. I don't have to come with a veil and cover my face now because I'm reflecting the glory of the Lord. That was the old way. How much greater is the new way and the new covenant? Come on. Now this is where we get into trouble. Who wants to reflect the glory of the Lord? This is a trick. I'm letting you know ahead of time. Okay. Yeah? I saw all those hands. Okay. Now let's read Romans 8, 16 through 18. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Okay, how many people still want to reflect the glory of the Lord? Let me see those hands. Almost the same amount. Suffering. Did Jesus suffer? Did he walk in the glory of the Lord? Yes. Yes. So we can share in his glory, but we're also going to share in that suffering. And this is where people say, oh, no thanks. I don't need the miracles. I don't need the power. I don't, I don't need that because I don't want to suffer. We love you, Jesus. Come on. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Nothing you are suffering now compares to the glory that you will see later. When he reveals his glory to you, hallelujah. That glorious day when you're in his presence, hallelujah. Your suffering now compares nothing to that. And some of you are suffering greatly. And here's the warning, and this is what the Lord told me. When I asked him that question, Lord, why don't I see this glory in your churches? And the first thing he said to me is, daughter, my children are not reflecting my glory. And the second thing he, he brought to me is that there's an Ichabod spirit operating oh, in the church. Oh. A spirit of Ichabod yeah. that has come in the church. So we have a choice when suffering comes. Are we going to reflect the glory or become an Ichabod? And I'm going to tell you about Ichabod in 1 Samuel 4.19. We have to be careful. It's so easy when the suffering becomes so great to become Ichabod. So 1 Samuel 4, 19 says, Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near her time of delivery. When she heard that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth. Anybody ever gave birth before? Feel like you're dying, right? Well, she died in childbirth. But before she passed away, the midwives tried to encourage her. Don't be afraid, they told her. You have a baby boy. But she did not answer or pay attention to them. See, people with an Ichabod spirit, you try to encourage them in the Lord, but they won't hear you. They don't want to be encouraged in the Lord. She would not listen to them. She would not pay attention to them. And she named this child Ichabod, which means, where is the glory? Wow. Or the glory has departed. Yeah. For she said, Israel's glory is gone. She named it this because the ark of God had been captured and because her father-in-law and husband were dead. Mm. Then she said, the glory has departed from Israel. The ark of God has been captured. See, in her suffering, Ichabod, the glory is gone. She named her son Ichabod because
because her suffering was so great, she said, the glory of God is gone. And how many of us, when the suffering comes and it becomes too great, we give up on the glory of God. And we just believe the lie of the enemy. We're not going to make it. It's never going to get better. We take the glory out. And we have churches and we have ministers and we have ministries full of the Ichabod spirit. Well, and where the Ichabod spirit is, they have already decided and agreed that there's no glory. So why would the glory of the Lord come if you've already agreed that there is no glory? Where the spirit of Ichabod is, there will be no power in miracles. What are you suffering? In your suffering, you can still reflect the glory of the Lord. Right. You don't have to give up and say there's no more glory. Right. You don't have to adopt an Ichabod spirit. And if there's Ichabods in this church. Yeah. You do nothing but grumble and complain in your suffering. You tell the whole world about it. You go on social media and you grumble and you complain about how horrible your suffering is. And then you expect God to show up in his glory? No. What if you went to his presence like Moses did and say, God, and let God give you the answer and let God change the situation and let God's glory shine. Death is an opportunity for God's glory to show up. Let's look at Lazarus. He was dead. The situation was dead. And she, his sister is crying. Jesus, if you would have shown up four days earlier, he wouldn't have died. And she's mourning and she's crying. And it said when Jesus showed up, he was angry. I get angry at dead situations where the Ichabods are and they, they won't receive encouragement and they just de decide it's done. Yeah. There's no glory. I'm angry. And Jesus had said he was angry, but you know he was angry not to sin, right? It says, but Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell is terrible. Some of you in your suffering, the smell has become terrible. It's terrible. And Jesus responded to Martha, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Do you believe that you will see his glory? They didn't believe it. They believed it. It was too far gone. He was already smelling. It was dead. There was no hope. They had all accepted Ichabod. So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of these people standing here. So they would believe you sent me. He wanted to give God glory. See, he already heard from heaven. He already knew what God was going to do. But he had to proclaim it to the people so that God would be glorified when he said, Lazarus, come out. The glory of the Lord. And God was glorified in that moment. What is dead in your life? What is suffering? Have you allowed Ichabod to come in? Or will you be a Stephen? Will you be like Moses? Will you be like the great men and prophets of God who reflect his glory? All the prophets suffer. The apostles suffer. Guess what? If you have a great call in your life, you're going to suffer. But it's all for his glory. That he may be glorified. Because when he shows up and when he changes the situation and your healing comes and the provision comes and the building comes and the miracles start happening, you start reflecting his glory and he is glorified. He wants you to reflect his glory so that he may be glorified. And, and the Lord has been confirming my message so much to me this week. And I love confirmation because it lets me know that I really hear from the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so um, somebody that no longer goes to our church um, had donated clothes.
for our homeless outreach for us. Um, but I've learned in the past that it's wise to look through bags because oftentimes, in this case, there were some things that needed to be tossed out that you wouldn't want to pass on. So um, as I opened the bag, this was the first thing I pulled out was this blue t-shirt. The very first thing out of three or four bags of clothing that I pulled out. And when I opened it, this is what it says. <laughs> Jesus, the veil has been torn over his mind and his heart, and we release the glory. 